Uh, so good afternoon everyone and welcome to um, today's webinar and it's our first webinar of 2021 for the CRPR East Anglia Committee. Um, today's topic is on top 10 top tips to video storytelling success. Um, it's fantastic to see so many of you on the call today, some familiar faces and also some new ones. So I really hope you enjoyed today's session. Um, before we begin, um, so there's a couple more people I need to let in. Um, before we get into some housekeeping rules, kind of the official stuff that we have to say, and the webinar is being recorded and we will, we will upload it to the CIPR, CIPR East Anglia website in the coming days. Um, if you could keep your video off and your microphone on mute, that would be much appreciated. Um, today's webinar is about 30 minute presentation and then there will be time at the end for any questions you have, so uh, which you can submit throughout the chat box throughout the session. If we, if there, if there is are any questions at the end which, which we cannot get to today, we will ensure these are answered and uploaded to um, our website as well. Um, please do share your experiences of today's webinar with us on social media you can find us on twitter at cipr underscore east anglia and you can also search for cipr east anglia on facebook and linkedin so um, if i just move on to some introductions now um, my name is james sharp i'm a cipr east anglia committee member i've been working with the committee as co-social media lead since uh, about September last year, I believe. Um, in my day job, I work for the NHS across Mid and South Essex. I'm digital media and marketing manager. And one of the things that I'm really passionate about in my job is to ensure our patients have, um, and local communities across Mid and South Essex have a great digital experience. And this includes through video. So I'm really delighted to be able to host this webinar today. Um, today's guest speaker is Tom Gudgeon from 2Cube Creative. Um, 2Cube Creative are an Essex-based video production company based in the Chelmsford area. They they've been up and running now for six years and I've had the privilege to work with Tom for about five of those years um, and in some ways I think Tom you're probably a bit of an extended member of my team <laughs> uh, so supporting us to create some great quality videos um, and tell the stories of our communities. Um, which is which is fantastic. Um, a particular video for me that stands out that we worked on that I just wanted to talk about is one that we shot two or three years ago, which tells a story of some primary school children and their experience of visiting a local dementia care home. It's, it was all around intergenerational learning. And I do think Tom um, will hopefully go into a bit more about detail about that video during the session. Um, but if you do have the time, please do go and view the full edit on YouTube. Um, you, you just have to search Morden Up Project. Um, and it's just a great, a lovely example of how um, you can tell a story through video and to bring that to life. Um, so do, do go and watch that one if you have got the, the opportunity to do so. But without further ado, I will hand over to Tom and let you get on with um, your top 10 tips. Well, here we go. So. Uh... Although James has just said, everybody turn off your video, there are some points in my presentation where I need to see your faces or at least hear you. So just be prepared for that. Right, let me share my screen, uh, make sure that I share sound. Okay, hopefully you will all see my screen. James, can you see my screen? Just let me know that it's working. Yeah, I can, yeah. Yeah, good. So um, let's jump into it. So 10 tips to video storytelling success. So as James mentioned, uh, I'm Tom. I'm the Creative and Operations Director at 2Q Creative. Uh, we have worked with organizations of all shapes and sizes uh, to help them tell their stories through video. So as James mentioned, we've worked with him for the past five years or so. Uh, we've done work with Toyota, with Estee Lauder, with a number of small charities and national charities. Um, some of our favorite work was with uh, an organization called Show Race and the Red Card. Um, as you can imagine, they have a lot of incredibly powerful stories uh, that, that they can tell um, and a host of other ones. These are just a sort of a handful. So. The question on your lips um, will hopefully be, but why video? Um, you probably are all already aware of the power of video and why you should be using it. But I just want to show you a, a quick video from um, one of my colleagues, Toby, that we shot 
probably four or five years ago. So it's a little bit outdated. Excuse the hideous branding on it because, you know, they were, you know, they're four years old. So we'll, 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 we'll breeze over that. So let me just quickly show you this video from Toby. Hopefully. You can come in later on, on a call, but it's muted. <laughs> Brilliant. Love that. <laughs> right. This is always really, really good when the video just doesn't seem to work. So bear with me. It's always, always good. Technical issues. Right. Here we go. Let me get my screen back on. Right, so hopefully you will see my screen again. James, sorry, just tell me that you can see it again. <laughs> cool. Okay, so yeah, this is a video from Toby. I'm Toby from 2Cube Creative. In this episode, we're going to look at how video can be more powerful than text. This is the NBA official rulebook for basketball. Thanks, Evan. It carefully describes how a game of basketball is played, from how to score the most points to how long a game lasts. It's over 50 pages of detailed information which breaks down everything about basketball that can be put onto paper. But there's something about basketball that 50 pages can't communicate. A video speaks to people in a way that a block of text simply can't. A video enables you to take those moments and those ideas and really tell the story. Here, let me show you. If you have any questions about video, tweet us at 2CubeCreate with the hashtag YVideo. For any more information, check out 2cube.co. I'm going to stop it there before some more hideous branding comes up. Um, so I really, I'm Toby. I really like starting uh, most of the webinars that I've done with that video because it sort of showcases how using those visual cues can have such an impact and draw you in because I mean the last portion of that video didn't actually have any story to it necessarily but it goes to show that your attention is fixated by those moving images by the music track that's happening um, and it all sort of working together has that incredibly powerful impact that yeah, it's why video is so, so powerful. So let's face it, most people are on the internet now with you, with most users logging in from their phones and video is a surefire way for you to engage with your audience because it is the content that your audience wants and expects from you. But why though? It's incredibly easy to digest it can help boost engagement by showcasing real life scenarios that people can relate to better than that block of text or that, you know, MBA, uh, whatever it was, 50 page document that, you know, people who has the attention span to read that about basketball when you can go out and you can play it. Um, it can help support your key mess, your organization's key messages or, or you as an individual, your key messages and so, so much more. It's accessible. Add subtitles to your video and you're well on your way to accessing a vast audience that no matter how they view the content, you can use that video as a tool to help you drive sales, drive newsletter sign up, drive membership inquiries, launch a new service and so, so much more. Video is the best way to showcase your personality or your organization's personality. And the bottom line is that your personality and your organization's personality is what makes your organization or you 
who you are. And that is your USP. So how do you achieve success with video? This should hopefully be um, the question that is also on everybody's list, uh, lips. So unfortunately, um, although I'm going to give you 10 top tips to help you on your way, there is no guarantee that your video, whatever you decide to create, will be a success. Um, but you are better off doing something and honing your craft than sitting back with the same old boring text and letting your competitors gain that traction, gain that engagement, boost their sales through the use of video. So what should you create first? Number one, planning and pre-production creates better results. Think about the video that you would ideally like to create. Is there actually going to be any value in creating that for your audience? When we first started our company, yeah, six years ago, video was still a bit of a nice to have for organizations. A lot of people were producing videos because, you know, they, they had a pot of money that they wanted to spend and they create a video that they were really, really happy with. But what we then saw was, you know, they put that video in one place and that's where it stayed. They didn't do anything with that content. And that's, there's no value in doing that. What you've got to really think about is who are your audience? Do you have a detailed understanding as to who they are and why you're targeting them? You know, all of this information is now so readily available. And actually most of the work that we do is so heavily data driven because data is the most powerful tool with marketing. Take advantage of it when you're thinking about what content you're gonna put into a video. Think about what you want to achieve by creating your video. Are you looking to launch a new service, drive more sales, encourage people to sign up to a mailing list, get people to register for an event? This is generally speaking the most important element. Not only will it help you target your content, but it will also help you to see if you've actually succeeded with producing that video. Tracking the success of your videos is something that you should also really pay attention to because if you see your video hasn't performed as you wanted it to, you shouldn't let that get you down because not everyone gets your wonderful creative idea immediately. And if they don't get that, then that's where you can take the results of that video, look at the data, look at the engagement, review those results, and see if there's something that you may have missed or something that you could do differently to achieve better results next time. So that just goes to show that that planning stage and that reviewing your content, uh, your data, your analytics, your demographics is so, so crucial before you even think about what the video is gonna be. So, number two, grip people by their emotions. Sometimes the stories that you tell uh, through video don't necessarily have to be that sort of corporate blah, 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 that actually, you know, maybe your, your, your bosses will appreciate, your, uh, your chair, your trustees, whatever it may be, they might appreciate it, but does it? does it grip your, your audience's emotions? One thing that we say is that you should take advantage, and I use inverted, common, uh, inverted commas there for a reason, because your service users and your clients, your customers, are the people who have the most impactful stories. They're the people who, you know, when they tell you about how they started and how your service or product impacted their life that's 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 the gold dust there that's what you should be taking full advantage of you know telling a story that doesn't come directly from your mouth or your organization's mouth helps people trust you more and trust is key is a key factor when it comes to marketing testimonials are a great way to grip people by their emotions find that hard hitting story that you know relates to the vast majority of your audience. And again, go back to that data, look at that data to see you know, where people live. You can find out their incomes, all that sort of stuff. So take advantage of that. You know, If people see a similar person in their situation that has benefited from your product or service, they're likely to listen and to invest in your product, service, whatever it may be. 
And, you know, video is the way to encapsulate that and to tell that impactful story because who's going to read a blog post about John Smith? Whereas if a video, you know, lots of enticing visuals are in front of them, that's more likely to capture their attention. So as James mentioned at the start, we worked together a couple of years ago um, and we created uh, a video for Mid-Essex CCG. It was actually in 2018. Um, and it's not directly about a service that Mid-Essex CCG provide, but rather a success story from a project that they were involved in. Uh, involved in. It doesn't directly mention the CCG until right at the very end when they're talking about how they're going to research from the project. And the focus of the video is on the project itself and the key results. And those stories come from not Mid-Essex CCG, but come from the individuals who are actually taking part. So let's have a little watch. In an ancient Essex town, a very modern social experiment has been unfolding organically. Research tells us that younger and older people are the two groups of society most affected by ageist attitudes and marginalisation. But in the leafy suburbs of Malden, two forces to be reckoned with are challenging perception, meeting stigma head on, and the result has been life-changing. At All Saints, we believe that uh, as well as providing the fundamentals for children, so reading, writing, maths, we also need to make sure that they're the scientists, musicians, um, dancers of the future, so we give a broad balanced curriculum as well. However, to be able to do all of those things, they also have not, need to have life skills. So um, we want them to be problem solvers, we want them to be team players, we want them to be empathetic and compassionate um, citizens of the future. So to be able to develop those skills, you need to give them opportunities. Could a chat and a game of snakes and ladders reduce the amount of pills an older person is taking for their pain? Can a regular giggle with a group of 10-year-olds help someone's sense of well-being improve to the point of reducing the demand on a local GP? If the answers to these questions become yes, what impact could this have on the traditional landscape of local health commissioning? I had some anxieties because Leo is autistic and he does find um, being with people he doesn't know quite daunting. So he was a little bit nervous, but I think he felt that he wanted to do this to increase his confidence. Well, I did feel a bit worried at first because I thought that talking to like different people is basically um, a bit... It, it, I, I'm, I, I thought I wasn't confident enough to talk to other people. Longfield is a care home in Malden and we care for residents either with or without dementia. We've got 40 beds in total. Um, many of our residents will be with us for quite a long time and we care for them like we would a member of the family. It was a bit scary walking in, um, but I think once you were in and you'd met all the other people, it was okay to be in that environment. I felt a bit nervous because they're people I never met before. Um, I was really nervous personally because, like, I don't know, my nan and granddad are quite active and obviously they had dementia so it was a lot different. I liked hearing all their stories of when they were younger and finding out a bit more about them. Thing was just seeing them smile and enjoying themselves. My favourite thing was when we we didn't like the second week when they all greeted us. Where they were so excited, they were like saying, "Hello, Leo. Hello, Fletcher." And it's also really nice. I'm autistic, which makes me I can't talk to people a lot. And if I didn't do that project, I wouldn't be in front of this camera and I probably wouldn't be able to do it. But 
now it's just made me feel a lot more confident. Um, I think I understand them a lot more because you met lo lots of different people with lots of different things and you just need to take their time, your time with them and once you get to know them you just understand what's, what you need to help them with. So. so we found that as the project built more and more people got involved and the interest grew. So having it as a regular project week in week out really helped. As a family we don't actually have um, many elderly relatives. Uh, both my husband and my parents are early 60s so I don't really class that as as old in this day and age. Um, so Alice's um, experience with elder, older people I say is quite limited. Um, so obviously with, with taking part in the UP project she's obviously got to meet people within their 80s, 90s, um, people with dementia who she's never sort of come across before and she's loved it, she's, she's blossomed. Um, he seems to be a little bit more understanding um, if we pass people in the street and they're slightly elderly, um, he's always rushed to like, help them. Um, there's a lady as we park for school every day and um, she always waves at us and he takes the time to spe talk to her. It's so easy sometimes to reach to a medication pad, but in actual fact, rather than giving a prescription, if we could give a prescription of sitting down and talking, particularly with young children, which they often aren't exposed to. I think this has considerable wealth, health benefits. The atmosphere and the children there is absolutely lovely. Um, I wish you could bottle it really and have that every day. But what has surprised me is that despite having dementia, many of our residents are remembering that the children have been there. They're talking about it the next day and asking when they'll be back. And that's just really lovely to see. And tomorrow, but the lady has no memory, um, I'll remind her that the children came and then she'll tell me all about it again. It is the highlights of her week. I love the kids more than ever. They put a lot into it. I look forward to it. I think it's because it's such a positive atmosphere and such a happy thing to have. That's why it sticks in people's minds and they do remember it and they are benefiting from it emotionally. Um, I think every school should have an up product because it makes children understand what old people are going through. It's it's really good to do that, to like take that experience so you know what it's like to be with older people. Because some people don't have the opportunity to have great grandparents, even and grand grandparents. So it would be good for them to be around old people and just to be so happy. I think everybody should have a project because it helps um, children as much as it helps the elderly. The UP project undoubtedly has had an impact on our Year 6 children and made them better, um, more compassionate um, citizens of the future. And we can already see in some of our Foundation children that are working um, with the um, members of Haley House that it's already impacting on them as well. Mid Essex ECG is supporting the UP project by trying to evaluate it. It's really important that this project isn't just a nice thing to do. We need to be able to prove that it has positive outcomes, both for the children in the school, but also for the residents in the care home. Uh, I really hope that if we can prove that this project is successful, both for the children and for the residents, that we can replicate it. If we can replicate it so that every school in Morden's doing this and potentially every school in Essex is doing this, we can make a real, real change to a generation of kids and a generation of adults. Well, best thing, probably staying out of school, but... Yeah. <laughs>probably one of our fav most favorite product projects that we've worked on um it's just there's something so wholesome and um i don't know just very lovely about it and there's the the, the kids who were on who we filmed and captured were just absolutely brilliant they were they were all stars and you know we had the pleasure of of watching them in action with with everybody and yeah it was just incredible and we were yeah we count ourselves very fortunate that we were able to capture um, such such a wonderful, wonderful story. Um, so moving on from the lovely niceness, let's get into the nitty gritty. Tip number three, repurpose your content. 
a video is not just for Christmas, much like a dog. Don't create one video and share it in one place because it's not just a nice to have. It's not a family portrait. It's a tool that you need to take advantage of. Create multiple assets from that video. For example, that up video, uh, we created a shorter version for Facebook and Twitter, which had just over 70,000 views and over 700 interactions. Just make sure that when you're creating that video, that you take full advantage of the assets that you are capturing. And make sure that you think back to that very first tip of the end goal for the audience for that video campaign. Is it right for them? Creating short form versions for social media is, you know, it's a no brainer. You've got to do it nowadays. And this way you can create multiple assets from that one video. You know, you could potentially create a mini series telling different elements of that story in multiple videos. The shorter video that we actually created for the UP project, that was just a little teaser video that we did. That was just a shorter, slightly shorter condensed version. I think it was like the first, I think it was the first two minutes or something like that, that we used to just, you know, tease the project and, and build people's anticipation for watching that full video. And it was, a resounding success, as you can see by those the, the numbers. Use creating those smaller assets can help retain your audience, uh, re help retain their attention, and get them coming back for more content from you. Just a little point to make: so on Twitter, you've got two and a half minutes. You've got video on Facebook. You've got videos performing better if they're over three minutes in length. And Instagram has the limit of 60 seconds for a grid post and then up to an hour for an IGTV. Stories on both Instagram, but you've also now got fleets. You've got LinkedIn stories. You've got, I don't know, Spotify stories. You've got Monzo stories. Everyone's doing a story this year, but they're usually about 15 seconds in duration. But you can create a longer video. It'll just spread them over those different stories and fleets and whatever you call them. Mm -hmm. So repurpose your content. Don't just create one video, put it in one place and hope that you're going to get a million hits because it doesn't work like that. You've got to put the work in to get the results from your content. Tip number four, if you're going in front of camera, be natural. Sometimes, in fact, more often than not, this is easier said than done. Um, and especially doing the work that we do, we are the ones behind the camera and we put people in front of the camera and we say, just that natural. Um, obviously, we do a little bit more than that. Um, unless you're targeting your, you know, your corporate bodies, your, your bosses or anything like that, relax, be yourself. And most importantly, like we said at the top, showcase your personality, making your messaging more natural, relaxed, uh, having an informal tone losing that sort of regimented scripted voice because at the end of the day people don't like robots people can tell when you've scripted something if you read it too by the line um it's, it's so crucial that you relax you take it easy you you convey who you are using everyday words in your videos is also so 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 important especially working with the nhs there's been a couple of times when they've wanted to throw in some wild medical term and we've gone, hang on a second, who are your audience? Everyday people, do they know what that word means? Probably not. If they don't know what that word means, then throw it out. We don't need it. If we can say it in a simpler way, say it in a simpler way. Because again, think of your target audience. Are they going to understand that? If not, then lose it. When we're shooting, we often like to say um, the camera is a person. Um, we, in part of that Why video series that uh, Toby at the beginning, um, we did a video about how to sort of get yourself comfortable in front of camera. Um, lots of people struggle when they have a camera shoved in their face. Um, I think lockdown has potentially helped that a little bit because people have had to have a camera shoved in their face of some description. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's the small things like ensuring you're comfortable in your chair the room temperature is right, you're not too hot, you're not too cold, and that you take your time because those little things can make such a huge difference to the end video if you're the one talking or, or you've got somebody talking in that. Because at the end of the day, 
you want to ensure that the end result is as good as it can be. So you need to take your time. If something doesn't sound right or didn't come across how you had intended it to come across, then do it again. There, there's no shame in having like 60 takes uh, and doing some of the stuff for the NHS, 60 takes is sometimes what it gets up to. Um, but that's absolutely fine because you know, at the end of the day, it's got to, you've got the, the end goal is to produce a video that resonates with your target audience. And if you're there stumbling your words or saying big, big words that make no sense to them, then there's no value in that. So you're better off spending the time relaxing, thinking about what you're going to say, making sure that it comes across and don't be afraid to, to play it back whilst you're shooting something to make sure that it did come across exactly how you wanted it to. Tip number five, think about your visuals. Talking heads are absolutely fine. However, they're not the only option. And that's something that I, I've been driving to more clients more recently because more often than not, people just think, oh yeah, we'll just have a talking head. But actually adding in those extra visuals, whether that be uh, extra video shots, stills, graphics, whatever it may be to help sort of fill out that story, that's, that's where the, the value comes. If your video does rely heavily on an interior script, then listen and pay attention to help you identify those additional elements that you could be capturing. You know, if someone mentions uh, enjoying the beach, then show it. If someone mentions they do a lot of volunteering, show it. If you could improve the visual experience by showcasing a, a town or a village, show it. Much like we did in that up video, you know, we talk about Morden, we see Morden. We talk about in, in the individual children, we see those individual children interacting with the older people. That's where you build that story and you, you give that story more value, more worth, and you make it more of that visual journey that people can go on. So long as the additional shots add to the story, use them. Don't add shots just for the sake of adding shots. Um, because that's my fear when saying what I've just said is that you'll go out and you'll suddenly have a video that's made up completely of B-roll is what, what the technical term is. But actually, if there's no value in adding those shots, stick it to the simple interview. Sometimes that is actually all you need and all you should be focusing on. Um, sometimes as well, you don't even need sound. Um, or audio or somebody talking in your video to convey your message, to, to tell your story. Utilizing strong evocative visuals like the ones that were used in that video with Toby uh, at the beginning of the presentation can actually help get your message across. You know, when you're sharing a video, you're not just sharing the video. You will often share a piece of copy that goes along with it. So if you can add it to the copy, and it's not vital to the key message of the video, add it to the copy. Don't add more text and unnecessary visuals to that video. Focus on what's really, really important. Number six, don't be afraid to get creative. As a digital marketing and production company, we try our best to encourage people's creativity. Our slogan uh, is let's get, let's get creative for a reason uh, because we want we don't want to just, you know, be told, go and shoot a talking head and that's the video because, uh, yeah, there's no, there's no joy in that. So don't go for the easiest option is, more, is what I'm pretty much saying uh, with the plainest visuals. Let your creativity run wild because you may be surprised as to what you think of and how you think of telling your story. And I think something that often happens is people forget about their creativity in their mind. They think, right, we need to produce a video that tells this story, let's go do that. But actually, if you stop at that sort of, we need to tell a video about this, it's stop at that stage and go, right, how can we actually convey this message to people that will gain the results that we actually want to see from this story? And don't be afraid to learn from others. If you see another organization, an, indiv an individual, someone on YouTube, uh, a TikToker, whatever it may be, that you think they've got it right there, take note of that, take advantage of that, learn from that, and you know, replicate it if it works for your organization or you as an individual. Because if it appeals to your audience, then you should be taking full advantage of that. Number seven, 
Now, number seven and eight are linked here, so just bear with me because this might not be what you're expecting. Use the professionals. Sometimes if your budgets allow, you should take advantage of an external company to help you create that video. But if you do that, make sure that you actually take advantage of them. Don't just tell them to go shoot this because we want this video. Listen to the advice they give. Inform them about your audience. Give them access to your data so they can understand your audience. Let them be involved in your campaign ideas to help them create assets that may even perform better than what you initially had in mind. Because you know, they're the creative geniuses. I mean, that's a bit big headed of me to say that, but you know, they're, they're the people who do it for a living, who know how it works. And they're the people that you should be listening to for that advice. Don't just tell them what to shoot and when to shoot it. They are professionals for a reason. They understand how video works best, how to gain the best results for you, how to tell that story through video and what visuals may work for you. Um, because, you know, we often get people who say, yeah, we want to tell this story with, um, we've got, you know, this one location and that's it. And we go, hang on a second, what's the whole story? Let's try and create a bigger picture here that can actually showcase everything involved. But, what you've got to remember, oh, excuse me, what you've got to remember is you've got to work with them. Don't let them work for you. You've got to look, work with them. Let them learn as you learn and develop the video campaign. It's, it's always risky going for just a single video from a production company because you can't, you, you don't have that process of learning and adapting and changing and, and developing that relationship with each other. And prepare to repurpose that content because, as I said, there lies more value. Building that relationship with the company means that as time progresses, you'll understand each other better. The company will understand your key messages and your key goals, and you will likely gain better results. You know, as James mentioned, we've worked together now for almost five years. And there's a reason for that because we've now built this relationship we, we each understand the end goals, the, the, the campaign ideas, and that's where the value lies. However, number eight is don't always rely on the professionals because although the professionals know what they're talking about and will likely to, uh, be able to produce better quality videos, they are not the be all and end all. Um, now this is where I need some hands or some yays um, for me. So how many of you have got a smartphone? I mean, I can see somebody who um, is already on their smartphone watching this Zoom call. So how many of you have actually got a smartphone? Just raise your hand, shout hello, whatever. I'm expecting yeah. literally everybody to respond now and how many people are there in this call? Hello. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Right there, you have all got access to one of the most powerful tools on the market. You have a device in your pocket, on your desk, wherever it may be, that can shoot up to 4K video footage, a device that can edit that 4K video footage, and a device that can share and schedule that video footage. So my question to you would be, what's stopping you? It's probably that you're not necessarily confident in shooting or know how to frame your shots, how to light your shots, how to get your audio sounding right. So let's then start with some simple, uh, simple tips to help you get off the ground with your production. But of course, don't forget all the planning that has to happen before you start taking advantage of these tips. So does anybody know what this is that's on the screen at the moment? Uh, and again, this is where I need some audience uh, interaction. Heather, your video is still on, so I'm going to come to you just because I can see you. <laughs> You're still on mute. Hang on. There Sorry, I was in a meeting for the first part of this and... <laughs> I'm on a smartphone and it's really difficult. So it's the rule of thirds, isn't it? So really Perfect. everything you, you want to focus on should be on that middle square. Okay, right. So yes and no is the answer to that. So I am just going to uh, draw some incredibly crude drawings. Hopefully this shows up where, oh, hopefully this will show up. Yes, there we go. Can everybody see that crude circle that I've just drawn? Yep. Okay, good. So uh, 
this is, yes, the rule of thirds. This is probably the safest technique that you can take advantage of. Most mobile phone cameras have got a grid that comes up on the display. Uh, and if not, it's in your settings, find it, use it, take advantage of it. So the rule of thirds is something that you should try your best to take advantage of. If you're capturing an interview with an individual, I wouldn't necessarily say frame them in the center of that shot, but what the general rule of thumb is that you put that eye line on that top frame, on that top line. Oh God, here we go. Here's some terrible, terrible drawing, drawings. Eye line on the top of that top line and then make sure that you leave enough space between the top of the frame and the top of their head, obviously, but make sure that their eyes are on that line and then you're sort of on your way to a successfully uh, decent frame shot. So let me now clear that. Another thing that you can do with interviews is uh, leaving that leading space, something that's called leading space. So as an example, let's position um, my crew drawing on this side of the frame. So we frame this person on the left-hand side uh, of the frame. And this person, for example, would be having an interview with someone or something like that. And this person is going to be looking in this direction with the person being off camera to this right-hand side. So this space here is called your leading space. So Generally speaking, you will only see it when, you know, the opposite way around if you're watching some creative artsy movie um, where they like to break all the codes and conventions. Um, so if they're on the left hand side, get them talking across the right. If they're on the right hand side, get them talking across the screen. Just make sure that they're talking across the screen as opposed to hang on, as opposed to talking off screen like that, because it just doesn't look right. Another thing that you can use the rule of third, thirds for um, is when you're shooting scenery shots. So for example, you would use this baseline here for your horizon. So anything that you're shooting outside, if you're shooting a beautiful landscape shot, use that baseline as where you set the horizon. Um, especially if you know you've got the sea there or a rolling hills or something like that. However, on the same token, you could also decide to frame your shot with the horizon on the top of the frame there. Um, and by doing that, you then create more space here. So perhaps some action is taking place down here that is actually the main focus of your content. Another thing to note is that you can use these different thirds for different parts of your content. So, you know, you might frame um, a tree over on this side and then you've got your action happening in these two, uh, two thirds here. So it's using those rule of thirds to your advantage, but also, you know, thinking about your, those shots. So positioning your eye line on that top line, positioning your horizon on that bottom line, where it all makes sense, making sure that if you're filming that interview and you're capturing someone that they're looking at cross, that they've got that leading space in front of them. So that's one of the basic um, sort of framing techniques that I would advise you all take note of. Lighting. The sun is obviously the most fabulous source of light and diffused through a window can create a lovely soft light on somebody. However, if you can't necessarily take advantage of natural light, I would always urge you to invest in some form of artificial light. You know, nowadays you can pick up a set of soft boxes, which is probably what I would suggest. Um, for about 60 quid. So there's really no excuse as to why you shouldn't use them. The reason why I would say use a soft box as opposed to the light that you have in your room is because a soft box is designed for video. So it, it emits the right light, whereas your light in your room, I think in the UK, we're at, they're at 50 Hertz. And sometimes on a camera that can cause that sort of flickering uh, and that's obviously something that you want to, to avoid if possible. Never, ever, ever shoot against a window unless your camera is capable of doing so. You know, most, most recent modern smartphones have got a pretty decent um, dynamic range. And the dynamic range means that, you know, if you are shooting against a window, my face would be lit, but also you'd still see what was outside of the window. 
if your camera doesn't cope well with that, avoid shooting against a window because what you'll end up with is a really washed out background that doesn't necessarily look great. Take advantage of your beauty spots. And, and I don't mean on your face, I mean literally locations. So, uh, you know, it might be the, the nicest office that you've got in your building, uh, a beautiful spot that you know outside, but use them to your advantage. And James will probably scoff now, but Magnolia looks terrible on camera. Please, for the love of God, don't choose a room with Magnolia because the NHS love Magnolia. There's a lot of Magnolia building, uh, Magnolia rooms uh, in the NHS, but if you can avoid them, avoid them. The next tip is about sound. So uh, a lot of people forget about the sound quality, but actually the audio quality of your video can make a huge impact on the end result. So choose a spot that's quiet and you're unlikely to have any interruptions. Turn off the fridge or air conditioning unit to lose that hum sound. You know, it's only temporary, just turn it off. And what I would say is invest again in a little microphone that you can plug into your phone because again, they're relatively inexpensive now, but they can make a huge difference. So I would suggest uh, like a, a Rode shotgun mic or something similar. If you're looking for a shotgun mic, it's called. Um, and I would suggest that because it's probably the most versatile uh, microphone that you can take advantage of. Uh, you can obviously get a lapel mic and things like that. But actually, if you're shooting in multiple locations with different people, having that little shotgun mic that you can attach to your phone is an incredibly powerful tool to have. So number nine, create something. With all those tips being said, don't let them stop you. If you feel like there's a hurdle there, you know, if you don't have the, the budget to invest in artificial light or, or a microphone, don't let that stop you. That's not, that's not a, a valid excuse anymore because sometimes you don't have a choice as to where you can film. James, I'm looking at you again. Sometimes you have to use that Magnolia room. Um, so long as the story is powerful, that's what matters. It's not about the gear, but it's about the end story. You know, as an example, in that up video, we had some shots that were slightly washed out and there was some hum in some of the audio, but did that detract from the story? And this is where everybody shakes their head and says, no, no, of course not. Um, so my, 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 my plea to you would to be just create something, tell a story, plan that video and create something to test the waters because your first video is always the hardest. And, you know, we look at videos we created five years ago and we scoff at them. We go, God, that's terrible. Why do, how do we ever get away with producing something like that? V creating video is something that you'll always be evolving. You'll always be advancing your skills. You'll be learning something new about your camera each time you use it. You'll be learning about, you know, the particular spots in your office that look really good. And I, I would just urge you to create something. So... The final tip is to think about where you're sharing your content, because this is something that you should pay attention to, especially before you start shooting your video, which may sound a bit strange, but actually where you're sharing your video is so important to how you then produce that video. Interestingly, most people watch video on their phone and they don't have sound turned on. You know, they might be on the train, not so much now, but, you know, they, they very rarely watch video with their sound on. That's, pro that's, that's probably changed over the past eight, nine months. However, it's still something that, to, that you should pay attention to because adding subtitles to your video will then broaden that reach. You know, if you scroll through Twitter or Facebook and you see a video that hasn't got any subtitles, but you don't fancy clicking on it because you're in a meeting or something important like that, but you're still, you know, browsing through social media, which I'm sure everybody does. Um, if it doesn't have subtitles, you're going to scroll straight past it. You're not going to engage with that content. Whereas if it's got any subtitles, at least you can see what the video is about without actually having to listen to it. And again, think about the format. Are you shooting 16 by 9, 9 by 16, 1 by 1? Are you shooting it for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, stories, fleets, etc.? All these things should be thought about because if I'm shooting a video for Instagram, I know that I've got to allow for that vertical framing 
for the end video. So I want to make sure that I give the individual enough space around the side of them so that we can actually crop that video down in post-production. Something that you know you may not necessarily think about, but actually is is something that is really, really important. And that's it. If you've got any questions, let's uh, open the open the table and uh, we'll we'll go from there. Thank, thank you, thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you, Tom. That's fantastic. For it was an excellent presentation and lots of great practical tips and takeaways. We even picked up a few new things myself, which is always a bonus. Um, we we are running a little bit over, so if people do have to drop off. Totally understand. Um, but if you can hang on for questions, um, please do. Um, there's a couple of questions in the box, Tom. That I'll read out first, but then if anyone yeah. wants to ask Tom a question direct. Um, please feel free um so nicola's asked tom around um music so she would love some tips on sourcing good three music um and or the value of sourcing permission and copyrighted material in their limited experience it's been a bit of a palaver but the video seems to show how worthwhile it is to get it just right okay so i as a production company we have um access and a license for um a, a number of different websites that produce copyright free music so they specifically create royalty free versions of you know popular music tracks um that i would urge you to take advantage of there is a cost involved with that however on youtube there's actually a number of channels where you can find copyright free music so and i think youtube themselves actually have a, a channel where um where you can download free copyright free royalty free music um if you desperately 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 want a you know a big music track um i would just say get over it um use something else because it's not worth the challenge unless you've got the budget behind it it's not worth trying to to get access to it because it's as as Nicholas said, you know, it's it's not a straightforward process. It is incredibly challenging. And source local, you know, take advantage of those small local creative artists that you know you can use their their, their music or their their visuals or whatever it may be. Um, in addition, you know, there's also uh, to the platform where we get our copyright free music. They also now um, have you know tons and tons of video footage. And of photos that are all copyright free, all stock that you can use for whatever purpose you desire. And that's something that I would also potentially suggest looking into. Um, again, there's a cost involved with that. But if you're going to be taking advantage of that and using those assets uh, on a regular basis, then it's well worth the investment of a couple of hundred quid a year. Thank you, Tom. Um, I think the other thing I would say on that is that in the NHS, we've, we've created some videos ourselves and we've used an organisation, a website called bensound.com. I don't know if you've come across that, yeah. but yeah. we get some really great um, royalty free music on that. You have to put credit on the end um, for the website, but it's a small price to pay. Um, well, and, and that's something to know that, you know, if if you are using that copyright free, free music, make sure you, you you sort of take note of that because some places request that you do put a little yeah. credit to them somewhere in the video or somewhere in the description or something like that. And if that is the case, just make sure you do it because at the end of the day, you're using their work for free. So give them that little you know kickback um, by literally copying and pasting a, a copyright notice, basically. Uh, so yeah. yeah, I would urge you to do that. Fantastic. Um, not really a question, but Amanda's put a good point on the chat saying that it's important to also avoid using acronyms in videos. I think that's definitely for the NHS. That's something we definitely avoid. <laughs> you, you and I. Um, yeah. and also, unless, unless the acronym is going to be used throughout that video, then get rid of it. But if it's going to be used throughout, make note, make mention of it at the beginning, uh, maybe have some form of full screen visual graphic that, that tells people what it means or you know, you reference it in your copy that you share when you share the video, because sometimes, yeah, you don't want to have to include a full a full name of an acronym in every time you mention it in a video. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Lauren's got a question here about how uh, we can adapt based on COVID nineteen restrictions, meaning we can't go onto campus and film staff and students at the moment where they want to avoid a, comp a compilation of people in their home offices and stock footage. So just kind of how you can get around so, restrictions and still go out and film 
So with uh, with with the latest uh, lockdown and restrictions, um, you are actually still allowed to go out and, and capture stuff. Um, obviously, the challenge that you face is that you people have got to be comfortable with that. Um, they've got to be comfortable with you going and filming them. But actually, you wouldn't be breaking the rules if you went and, and did some filming. Um, however, yeah, take advantage of stock video or alternatively use a platform like Zoom. I mean, we've we've done a number of records through Zoom for, you know, huge companies and they're not afraid to take advantage of that tool. So take advantage of it. You can still direct somebody. You can be on a call and you can say, can you just position your camera there and then go and sit at that desk and open your laptop and, and do some work on that just so we've got that shot. You can still achieve those results. You've just got an extra little bit of a hurdle in place. But like I said, that's, that, that, that shouldn't be something that stops you. Think creatively about how you could achieve it and, and do something, create something. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, Heather's made a good point around um, subtitles that as well as we know people listen to videos um, with them on mute, but now, especially in the public sector, you have to have it on for accessibility regs as well. So it's important that we- Yeah, exactly. It. Yeah, it's yeah. something that you should always, always be putting on. I mean, it's often something that you forget. Um, and I think that's easily forgivable. Um, but yeah, as, as you mentioned, it's something that you, you really should be putting on. And I mean, it's actually a blessing in disguise because as I said, most people watch videos without audio. So forcing you to put subtitles on is, yeah, is a blessing in disguise yeah. because it means that everybody will be able to access your video. Thanks, Tom. Um, I think I can't see any more questions in the chat, but if anyone's got any other questions they want to ask, please. There was, there was one more, James. I was from, there, sorry. Um, from Phil Harrison. Um, he said, are there any obvious giveaways of cheap slash homemade videos to avoid? Um, honestly, I don't think so. You know, something that we we as a production company like saying is, oh, was that shot on a potato? Um, but actually, even if it is shot on a potato, you know, sometimes that's, you know, where most of the value comes from. You know, the amount of viral videos that, that are successful, that don't have a huge, that don't have a production company behind them, don't have a, a, an agency behind it. It doesn't matter what you're shooting on it. Your gear should not be the limitation. Um, I think one thing that you should probably also think about investing in, if you're going to be shooting a lot of videos at home on your phone or something like that, is a little tripod. Um, most tripods you can get a mount that you can pl put your phone onto, just so you've got that stable shot. But again, saying that. Most modern phones have got image stabilizer on them, so your your shot will be very steady. Um, so I don't think there's anything that nowadays would really give it away. Um, and again, to me, that sounds like an excuse to not create something without without put pushing blame. But I think the that no matter what the hurdle, think about it creatively. Think about how you can overcome that hurdle. Think about how you can use that hurdle to your advantage. So. You know we're working from home with these are the challenges you know you're not alone we're working from home we're also doing it this is the challenge that we're facing use that to your advantage thanks tom i think we're just a one more quick question um george has asked um if you're using an iphone to film in what kind of editing tools are there available to do that maybe if you're editing on a phone or a tablet or something so uh, if you're using an iPhone, the one that I would straight away suggest is Apple's very own um, editing software that you can get on your phone, which is called iMovie. Um, there are umpty number of other slightly more professional editing tools that you can take advantage of on your phone, but I would start with iMovie. Um, you can still add subtitles uh, through that. And if not, there's, there's other apps that exist that you can add on your subtitles after the fact. Um, but yeah, iMovie is what I would suggest if you're using an iPhone. Um, and if not, if you're on Android, um, there's a couple of other good ones. There's um, Climaster. Cinemaster, I think it is. I yeah. Think um, Climaster is the one for Android. Yeah, there's 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 quite a few that are yeah like incredibly good for what they are. They're yeah powerful tools to have. Fantastic. Um, well, we'll leave it there then. I've just got a bit of a closing thing to do. Um, so. 
firstly, Tom, thank you so much for your time today. Um, it's been such a fantastic session. And if anyone does have any other questions, please let us know and we'll put them to Tom or you probably can find Tom on Twitter as well uh, and, his, and his company. Um, if you are a CIPR member, you will be able to find the event on the CPD platform and it will count towards uh, five CPD points. Um, if you're not a member, please um, do consider becoming one. The CIPR offers some great benefits the CPD and you can find all that information on the CIPR website and before I go really quickly I just want to remind you of a couple of events that are coming up from the our CIPR East Anglia committee so both of them are next week so on the 19th of January our former chair will be hosting a session around um, the topic of well-being and how you can build that into project planning so that's going to be a fantastic succession especially in this current climate and on the 21st of January we're hosting a session with a local recruitment company we'll be offering advice and tops on CV writing job hunting and how to make use of career opportunities in 2021 so and we also have all of our virtual uh, meetups um, for you to join. The first one is tonight in Suffolk um, by Zoom. And you can find all those details on our event by page. So apart from that, just say thank you so much for attending and I wish you well and have a great afternoon and stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thanks for a great session.